Let's tape forever. Here's your weekly dose of relationship fuel with Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about why conflict is important, understanding the difference between needs and wants, how to ask for what you need with kindness, and how to raise issues without sounding critical. But before we dive into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? I had a really good work week last week. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I had a clunky start to 2023, Hmm. but last week found my- Mojo. Found found my mojo. Had a couple of really good client-facing meetings, had a couple of projects come to fruition, got some feedback on some stuff, like just- Career and business tank last week. Mm. Ticking those boxes. Yeah. yeah. What a, and then um, I had a really very restful weekend. Mm. I didn't yeah. do very much. I did a <laughs> couple of small social activities, but mostly I just rested and it was quite glorious. Extroverts yeah. who normally I like to be with people, but I just didn't really, wasn't We're buying it. it. Yeah. No. Yeah. What about you, Nath? What fueled you up? Uh, a couple of things over the weekend. So, I really enjoyed going out for dinner for Lunar New Year. Um, so, it was really nice to head into Chinatown in Sydney and go for a wander around and Eat immerse. some really delicious, delicious, delicious food. Yeah, it was really delicious and immersed myself with all the people. So, yeah, it was really fun. And the other thing I was doing on the weekend was immersing myself in one of my hobbies, which is homebrew. <laughs> Making beer. <laughs> Making beer. Actually, cider. Uh, so, I bottled the cider, which was, had a little taste test as well, and it turned out delicious. So, yeah. And I, I just enjoy being a little bit creative and making some things and getting some good outcomes. So, it was, yeah, good that it all came together. But now, let's introduce this week's guest. Today, we are very excited to invite back Laura Silverstein. Laura is a certified couples therapist, licensed clinical social worker, and has 30 years in the field helping couples find more happiness. She's a research clinician, speaker, trainer, and writer, and she's best known for her positive, action-orientated style. Laura has a brand new workbook with over 70 activities for couples to complete together, which builds on her first book, Love is an Action Verb, a relatable, surprisingly humorous relationship self-help book to read alone or with your partner. You can get it on Amazon or Audible or in all good bookstores. Welcome back to the show, Laura. Laura. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you guys. Yeah, it's amazing to see you too. Hey, so if you haven't heard Laura's previous episode, we strongly recommend to go back and have a listen because we only invite the best of the best back. So (laughs) uh, you know it was a goodie. But today we're going to have a bit of a different conversation. So last time we dug into a lot of like the foundational habits of um, an early relationship. And today we wanted to talk a little bit more about conflict, doing it well, how we can look after ourselves and our partner when we have those inevitable conflicts. So maybe, Laura, do you just want to kick us off with a little bit about like the importance of conflict, the role that it plays in a relationship? Sure. Well, I I always like to remind people that 100% of couples have conflict, right? Conflict is not bad. Conflict is about managing and integrating differences and differences are wonderful, right? That's what makes Mm -hmm. the world a beautiful place. That's what leads to learning and growth and challenge, right? So conflict, people sometimes think of conflict as fighting, but conflict is not fighting. It's, It's how do you manage differences in a way that both people can speak up and have their needs met. Both people are listened to, heard and understood. And hopefully you can make decisions together that integrate both people's perspectives as well. You know, make decisions, solve problems together. And the idea is let's do it efficiently. So we can go out and have more fun and and not spend any extra time than we need to rehashing fights or with what I call unnecessary pain, right? So there's Mm -hmm. obviously many aspects of relationships are difficult, but Mm -hmm. there's certain things that are, that are, don't have to be difficult. And that's Mm -hmm. sometimes we end up, you know, arguing about things that could be prevented by using some preventative strategies or catching yourself when you guys start to go sideways. I love that framing of conflicts because as you mentioned, like we are all different and we do have our differences and that's often what has attracted us to each other in the first place anyway. It's like, oh, 
well, I, I really like that you're super adventurous or something and I'm a little bit more reserved and I like that you push me and do those things. So, yeah, so having that confidence. That was a real life example. That, yeah. was, that was Nate <laughs> describing our relationship. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is those differences that often do attract you to each other. And so it, it's not surprising that you are going to have some conflict or some uh, maybe just like tension as well between the two of you when you are trying to figure out like how this is all working. It's funny because Nath is such a like calm and steady force in my life. And sometimes that just drives me so freaking crazy. Like, why are you not riding the highs <laughs> and the lows with me? And you're just like this beautiful duck on water. You don't really know what the legs are doing. But sometimes I'm very grateful for that. But other times, oh, just come on the crazy emotional <laughs> roller coaster with me. <laughs> so that's such a good point, Sammy, because sometimes it's not about the content of the disagreements. It's about the style of how you manage strong emotions and whether or not you like to talk about things and whether you get really animated and passionate, which is me, or other mm. people are a little more logical and they feel um, they when they start to feel like pressure is rising, they actually get calmer and other mm. people get more activated as a way to um, kind of up the ante and kind of say, listen to me, listen to me, I want you to understand. So sometimes the emotions rise, whereas mm. for someone else, when they feel like they're being misunderstood, then they just get even more like logical and practical and and, and kind of talking through the, the facts and figures. More analytical. Yeah, you've got the analytic, you've got sort of the emotional part of the mind having a conversation with the analytical part of the mind. And sometimes that can cause couples to be crossing wires. Yeah. So in that first bit, you sort of talked about this idea that conflict can occur when someone's needs are not being met. Can you talk to us a little bit about like, what do you mean by that? When you say needs, how do we know what is a need versus like what's a want? Because there's things that I definitely want that maybe aren't needs um, and, and vice versa. So when you're talking about that, what is it that you really mean? That's a good question. And, and sometimes it's important to check in with yourself and say, is this a want or is this a need? And if you can recognize that it's a want, then you're actually going to feel a little bit more calm and comfortable if you don't get it. But if it's framed as a need, you know, I need you to be better at taking the garbage out. Like, mm -hmm. well, okay. So if you frame it as a need and your partner just doesn't remember to do it, then, then does that mean that you're in a relationship where you, that you shouldn't be in? Like some people will mm -hmm. think, oh no, this is really horrible if my needs aren't being met, but really it's, my want isn't being mad and and I really am going to keep asking you to take the garbage out, but it's not a fundamental sense of there's something wrong with the relationship or wrong with me or you don't respect, care and love me. It just is probably hard for you to do that. Mm. So at the moment, we've got some friends who are trying to navigate their opposite end of the spectrum needs for financial security and stability. One of them grew up quite unstable and the other one had more of more stability and now the one who grew up in an unstable sort of environment is really looking to like build some financial stability security roots down and the other one just really doesn't need that they're like you know fly by the seam of the pants it always works out it always has worked out it always will work out now that they've identified this kind of uh, hurdle in their relationship they're trying to navigate well how do we find a midpoint or is a compromise always going to still feel like a lose-lose? Like, how can we collaborate? So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like, is that kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about a need? Sure. Really great example and very common example. Mm. So when I help couples with those kinds of things, there's two processes. There's one is understanding the underlying dream that's not being fulfilled. Mm. Okay. So, so one need might be freedom. One need might be security, for example, as I'm, I'm listening to the couple mm. that you described, but, but I'm not going to assume that as the couples therapist, I'm going to have couples talk to each other about that and ask questions. Mm. Why is this so important to you? 
what what is it like for you to to when you feel like you can fly by the seat of your pants like what what experience what emotion is connected to that what is um is there a connection to your family of origin and and i have couples and i kind of coach them to ask those kinds of questions and then the other partner would be saying you know what is there a fear or worst case scenario if this financial security need that you're talking about doesn't get met mm. and so First, you start with both people really trying to understand the underlying issues. And your couple sounds very wise, by the way. It sounds like they've already identified some of those things. So they're probably ahead of the curve as many, many people get caught up in content and they don't necessarily have the kind of insight that you're describing. So that's great. And then and only then can you get to compromise, because if you start with compromise, then it's just people kind of competing or trying to persuade. But if you understand why this is so important to your partner, you tend to be more motivated to give that person what they're asking for because you can see them as a little child instead of like, well, you know, why do, why can't we just spend this money? Why do we have to save this money? And it's just in the moment, it doesn't make sense to you. But then when you can connect and picture a little seven-year-old who brought their lunch to school and it was embarrassing because it was different than they, or they couldn't go to a field trip or something. And then all of a sudden, like there's an emotional connection to why that this conflict exists. So first I start with each person really trying to increase compassion for for the other partner in terms of why this why this conflict keeps happening and then we go to the compromise and then compromise is much more of a pragmatic kind of exercise where each person talks about their core needs and their flexible needs mm. or flexible areas we don't call them needs right so mm. so the core need is what can i absolutely not live without and then flexibility is you know i'd really love to go out to dinner more But I'm willing to do that monthly instead of weekly so that we can Mm. save. Then both people are looking, if you kind of picture a Venn diagram, you picture where's the overlap of where both people are willing to be flexible. And then they have a very like uh, kind of problem solving conversation around what they're willing to be flexible about and what they're not. Yeah. And that yeah. exercise is probably one of my favorite exercises because it it applies to money, it applies to how you know differences around cleanliness, it, it uh, lateness, it, you know how you want to spend your time, time with friends versus time together, mm. time with family, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I thought that's really interesting. Like what you brought up there, cleanliness, you know, and talking about you know, having a humming household where there's food in the fridge, there's clothes to wear, there's um, sanitary areas to use within your space. Like we've all likely got varying degrees of standards of what is the minimum standard of care for cleanliness and well-being in your home. Like how much food in the fridge is baseline? Like how many meals can we make from those ingredients? And, you know, at what degree is the empty light coming on? Is it when it's half full or is it when it's like literally there's a soggy cucumber left in there or do you know what I'm airing our literal dirty laundry here (laughs) so I have a very different standard of cleanliness for our floors than Nath like we have a dog who sheds fur like it's glitter it's like it's just everywhere all of the time (laughs) it drives me insane and it doesn't really bother Nath that much but here's the kicker I really hate vacuuming like I, I hate vacuuming so much that I tolerate the dirtiness standard of Nate's minimum care than mine because I hate the vacuuming more than I hate the dog fur on the floor. But this so is you're this. doing your own internal area of flexibility because of your conflicting yeah. wants. Yeah, and it's just like not worth it for me to like nag Nate all the time about, hey, can you please vacuum the floor like twice as often as you actually do? Because my standard is different than his standard. And it's just one of those things that I'm just like, does it really matter? Like, can I let this go? Like, can I move this to a flexible need rather than a fixed need? But I, I don't even know when we sort of started adapting that kind of language of like core needs. And this is something I really need from you mm-hmm. as my partner. Um, you know, and you're on the Date Forever podcast and we talk about, you know, dating yourself and really intimately knowing yourself and your chosen person so that you can date forever. But if people are not even aware of 
their own needs and can't sort of put language to it. Is there something that you can recommend to sort of start getting curious about your own needs? If you've never examined them before, where do we start? Mm. That is such a great question. And a lot of times we don't even sit down and think about what are my needs? There are so many people who are caretakers by nature Mm. and they're thinking about making other people happy and and maybe not even sitting down to think about what do they need or what makes them happy. Um, And many times that is about slowing down a little bit. Um, I think that we are very, very quick in our world where we move very fast and that sort of speed makes it hard to be self-reflective. And I think that as we start to slow down a little bit more and think about not answering questions quite so quickly, we might be able to catch ourselves. So if you ask me, where do I want to go to dinner? And I say, it's knee jerk reaction. Well, wherever you want to go, right? Where do you want to go? And as we start to slow down a little bit, it's, wait a second, you asked me a question, which was a generous question. Where do I want to go to dinner? And I'm doing you a disservice if I don't honor the fact that you're being generous by offering something to find out, to learn about me, to find Mm. out what kind of food do I like. And, and so there is a process of catching some of those knee jerk reactions that you may have learned as a kid, or there may be a part of you that is very focused on wanting to be liked and accepted by other people. So you might put your own needs aside and that's worth having conversations about with people that you trust. Uh, I definitely think that our loved ones can be very helpful to us because it can be hard to do this work on your own. Mm. But when you talk to somebody and you get in the habit of saying to a really good friend, like, no, no, you tell me, where do you really not know, you know, where you want to go? Let's talk about it. And so sometimes we can help each other slow down as a team teammates and our partners can do this too, so that you're not just taking the other person at face value. And then that's going to be a little bit easier for them to slow down as well. And then both mm-hmm. people can support each other and, and not being competitive about only trying to get your own needs met or being selfless and just putting your partner's needs first. You ultimately, the most, I shouldn't say healthy because that's, you know, is there really a standard for what's healthy and un- unhealthy? But I think we're happier when we feel like we're with a partner whose needs are being honored And Mm -hmm. ours are as well. And that decreases the risk of resentment as well. Yeah. I have um, a friend who is divorced. And in this marriage, like this is probably, they've been divorced for maybe five or six years now. And they've been able to do a lot of like growth and self-reflection on that marriage and the things that they learned, you know, and they were married very young and are still probably in their early 30s now. But this person talked about uh, the way that they honoured their partner in that relationship and that they self-sacrificed everything, that they never really considered their own needs to the point that they would, you know, very consciously go and use like the less good mug in the house because they always wanted their partner to have the good one. And, you know, which side of the bed did they want to sleep on? And what, yeah, what restaurant did they want to go to? What where, what holiday destination did their partner want to go to? And on reflection, they were like, I, I didn't really ever ask for what I wanted. So it was never feasible for my partner to even consider giving me what I wanted because I never advocated for it for myself. I think there's like this gap in there where one, identify what it is that you need and then the ability to ask for it. So is there some foundational skills that we can then layer on top of once we've figured out what we need um, more of or less of from our partner to then actually asking for it? Sure. It's such an important skill to develop and it's a life skill. I think mm. that we never really know if we've got it completely down, but but constantly to be working on improving our ability to ask for what we need with kindness, because mm. silence isn't kind, mm. that you're not giving mm. your partner mm-hmm. an opportunity to try to meet your needs if you don't tell them. So, so the silent, there's a risk of silence. The other risk of silence is that when you do finally speak up, it comes out hard and fast like a torpedo because Mm -hmm. you've been building and building and silent and pushing it under a rug. And then finally it does come out 
and you feel sort of maybe justified and and it maybe comes out with an edge or it comes out really with a passion that can sound demanding or that can sound Mm -hmm. critical. So there's two things that I would recommend. Number one is to work on your timing. For some people, and and this is self-reflection, for some people, it's about speaking up a little bit earlier than they might be inclined to. And Mm -hmm. for some people, it's saying fewer things. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily, I, I, it would take that self-awareness for somebody to be able to look and see, am I the kind of person that puts my own needs aside, puts them aside, puts them aside, and then I build resentment? Or am I the kind of person that is really, really focused on self-growth and advocacy and sometimes maybe because I didn't get my needs met and I'm trying to make changes, I'm speaking up and speaking up and speaking up and could do a little bit less of that or do it with more kindness. Let me just pause there and see if if that's making sense to you guys. Yeah, I think so. And about identifying where you might be on that spectrum, like on how much you are leaning into what it is that you're asking for or not. Like when I reflect on the early days of mine and Nate's relationship, like we didn't have a lot of conflict. Like we fought a lot in our first year while we were, I think, just trying to figure each other out. And we knew that we really had fallen in love with each other because we'd been living together for a year. And I was like, I already love you, but we've only started this romantic relationship now. Um, So we fought a lot in that first year. But then after that, we really didn't have very much conflict. And as I've reflected on that, I think that was both of us not always asking for what we wanted, not always asking for what we needed. And I think that absence of conflict was actually probably highlighting that neither of us were advocating for things that were important to us at the time. Whereas now I feel like we have far more conflict, but I feel like we handle it incredibly well. Like it doesn't it doesn't injure us. It doesn't inhibit us. We're able to like handle that quite efficiently and effectively and we repair quite easily. But I think, yeah, the absence of conflict was almost just like masking what was really happening. Yes. And then that could turn into conflict avoidance could sometimes turns into passive aggression, even though nobody wants it to, or just uh, that you're self-sacrificing. So that's, it's a good thing. And it sounds like it's really good that you guys caught that. And that, that makes sense too. the, the early phases of relationship, you're, you are going to be navigating that a little bit. And sometimes people are going to be less, you know, keen on bringing something up when you're having a great day. Like, why should I bring Mm. up how I feel about whether the kitchen, you know, the the kitchen counter isn't, isn't as sanitary as you want. So I, I think timing is good for that so that when you do bring things up, you can have what you're describing, Sammy, which is that it is less likely you, then it's, as we were talking in the beginning, it's sort of conflict without a fight. So Mm. it's a difference of opinion that you're negotiating and navigating, but nobody's feelings are getting hurt. Or if they are, it's quick and it's, oh my gosh, I'm sorry that I didn't say that right. Like it's quickly Mm. repaired. So by saying things a little earlier, you're more likely to be able to follow the communication skills that you've probably, everybody probably knows intellectually, right? Which is to speak in first person. Mm. The Gottman method has a very clear formula. It's called the gentle startup. And that starts, I feel. And then the next word that comes after the word feel is an emotion. Now, many, many people will try to do a soft startup. I feel attacked. (laughs) And that's why attacked is a verb, right? I feel like you don't understand. It's very, very different than I'm feeling misunderstood. Because one yeah. is putting the onus of responsibility on the other person, and the other mm-hmm. is this is my internal experience. So I feel emotion about situation. And so in the second part of the gentle startup, you say, I feel frustrated about, you know, waiting for you 15 minutes longer than you said you'd be home. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is like the situation without blaming the person, but you're, you're using kind of a neutral, a neutral way of describing what happened. And then you follow up with an ask. So my need or my request is to please just text me if you're going to be late. Mm -hmm. And so that way you're ending your statement, giving your partner an opportunity to succeed by giving you what you're asking for. If you don't add that request on the end of the I statement, 
then it's much more likely to turn into an attack defend pattern. Classic. And leading your person to how they can solve it, right? Like versus like, I just don't feel very connected to you. Like, how do they solve that? What would connection look like versus like, you know, my request would be like, I'd really love us to have a date every other week or yeah, whatever the thing might be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I also think it's really important what you just raised there about like identifying words that are actually feelings. And I feel like this was some of our early like work as we started to delve more into personal development and relationship education is like the level of like fluency that most of us have around feeling words is very limited like it's like fear joy like happy sad I feel good I feel shit (laughs) like it's not actually (laughs) like the depth of you know I don't know how many emotions there are there's probably thousands um, but I feel like most of us don't have that next layer of understanding of what we're yeah, actually Yeah, just vocab around like, yeah. you know, what's the difference between me feeling frustrated or annoyed or skeptical or dismissive or, you know, feeling ridiculed or disrespected or violated? Like, how do I know when I'm feeling those different things versus angry? Because angry is so, could still be so broad because I feel like, you know, going back to like real basics, like. I don't remember ever being taught that. I don't remember anybody sitting down with me and being like, "How? here's how you can label your emotions. And I, and I mean, this is still absolutely something that I work on. And Nath probably observes me go, it, it happens most when I'm like got off of a phone call or a meeting where I'm like, that didn't go right. What is it that I'm feeling? And I'll like literally get sit there with the feelings wheel and be like, hmm, what am I? Like, let me explore what it is that I yeah. think that I'm feeling here. Like, and I think sometimes we, even just that basic level of literacy of understanding what it is that you're feeling in your body and where are you feeling it? Is it in your hands? Is it in your feet? Is it in your gut? Is it in your head? Is it in your shoulders? Like, and getting to know how that emotion shows up for you and does it differ if the trigger is your person or someone else or, you know, an external thing or an internal thing. I, I think that even at that earlier stage of like even being able to identify that is a skill. I love what you're saying because it's so crucial and it's hard to do. One of the things that that also I think adds to what's hard to find the words for identifying your emotions is if you're in a fight flight state of mind, then you don't have access to complex thinking anyway. Mm-hmm. So then that cave brain is saying happy, sad, angry, scared. And those are the mm-hmm. three, right? Mm-hmm. That again comes to timing. Are you talking to your partner when you've taken the time to take some deep breaths, go for a walk when you're really angry, like to, to make sure that you're not talking about it in the height of your emotional intensity. Mm-hmm. You are allowing your heart rate to come down, allowing your breathing to regulate, notice all that muscle tension, letting that soothe, then you're going to have much more access to your frontal cortex to be able to think about all this. Di- what is the difference mm-hmm. between frustration and anger and resentment? So we've kind of talked about, yeah, the feelings will and, and needs and things like that. So how do we actually know if needs aren't being met, because I know in our example, early in our relationship, like, yeah, we we weren't fighting. I think we went for a couple of years without actually realizing that we weren't fulfilling our needs. And I'm actually not even sure how we started realizing that we might not be communicating all that well. Um, So how do we start to identify if we are not actually getting all of our needs met? Can I interject before? Sorry, Laura. So I think the turning point for us was when we identified a pattern of me raising an an issue or a concern or something that Nate had done that really fucked me off, like, let's be honest. And then the conflict would end with me soothing Nathan and revalidating that he was a good person. And the conflict wasn't then about the thing that he'd done that had upset him. It had been about me criticizing him and sort of trying to then repair that I felt like I had hurt him in having the in raising the thing. Mm. And I think it was probably after we'd realized that that was a pattern. And it was like, well, every time I raise something that I want to be better in our relationship, it ends with me, you know, trying to re recover and revalidate you that I do love you and I'm not going to leave you. And I just want this to be better. And we probably sat in that pattern for quite a yeah, while. Wow. So it was probably after that that we were like, something's not working here. How do we do this better? Right. And 
I love that you were able to figure that out, but I also think it's important for your listeners to also not be too hard on themselves if they're not quite there yet, because it also Mm -hmm. is a developmental stage in a relationship. So it's not like, oh, I wish we could have done this earlier. You may not have been able to, and that's okay. So relationships will develop and grow over time. And what that requires is increased vulnerability. So when you first go on a first date with someone, sometimes people read, oh, you know, vulnerability leads to intimacy. So they'll go on a first date and be really, really open about something really private and hope that, you know, their partner or their date will think, oh, wow, now I feel really close to you because, you know, we call this trauma dumping. Yeah. And I've recently learned that this can be a response to having really poor personal boundaries, that deep oversharing with with someone who really hasn't earned that information and they haven't earned the right to know that about you yet. Well said. So it's really wise to test the water slowly and see if it's safe to be open and vulnerable with your feelings and with your Mm -hmm. needs and your wants. And if the person that you're speaking to responds in a way that that gives you a green light, then you can slowly keep going. But mm-hmm. that way you're protecting yourself from if you see, ooh, I shared something a little bit private and that didn't go so well. Ooh, I'm going to notice that. Mm-hmm. And of course, then I'd be saying, okay, are you sure you want a second date? Even if that mm-hmm. person's really cute. Like when mm-hmm. I give dating advice, that's a lot of what I say is like, how are they responding to you? What are they, are they asking you questions when you're being, you know, are they being vulnerable with themselves or just, pr- so there's a lot of things to look out for in that dating process. But I think then as you've been dating for a little while, then there's certain patterns that come come up. And at first you're just, there's so many other things happening. You're falling in love. You're also living your life. You're, you know, you're getting to know each other. Mm. You're having lots of fun, hopefully, and going on these great dates. And so these patterns, it's normal for them to start to start to happen. But the vulnerability as over time, you feel more and more comfortable being vulnerable than you, Sammy, were able to share like, hey, you know what? Like I'm noticing there was something you did that I didn't like and now I'm Mm. comforting you. That took vulnerability because at this point, then how is Nate going to respond? Was he going to say, oh, wow, let's look at that. So thank goodness he did, right? Mm. (laughs) Because that's the way that then he's looking at his contribution to the problem and the solution and so are you. Yeah. And also I think there was an element there of me learning how to give that feedback without it coming out as like criticism of like, you're not a bad person. You maybe just did a bad thing. Like, and that difference of like me not labeling. Yeah. That thing. So can you maybe help us? Like, how do we um, ask for what we need without sounding critical of them as the person and more about the behavior? Sure. Really great question. And that is the thing that's going to make or break you guys, like everybody. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out how to ask for what you need without putting the problem in the person, but putting Mm -hmm. it in the behavior, you are 90% there in terms of conflict management. Mm -hmm. So think about it like playing in Australia. Is it soccer? Yeah. Soccer. Soccer. Round ball. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So you want to kick the ball into the net. You don't want to kick your partner's shins. And Mm -hmm. what happens is when you put the problem in the other person, it's like, you're inconsiderate. And -hmm. the other person is like, what? They're thinking of all the times that they would, but I just made, you know, I just bought you a hamburger. So they're thinking I am considerate. And then you're in a fight. But Mm -hmm. if you're like, that hurt my feelings when you forgot to reach out to me when we were at that party and just check in. Next time, can you do that? You're saying the behavior. This Mm. is the thing I didn't love, um, that you didn't check in with me to make sure I felt comfortable. You Mm. you know, when you were just talking to your friends and you kind of lost track of me a little bit, I'm sure you didn't mean to do it. And that's the other thing that I, I recommend is that you add other things that you're not assigning intention to the Mm. negative behavior. So Mm. if Nate wasn't talking to you at a party because he was like caught up with his old, you know, high school buddies or whatever, like you're, you want to move forward, like assuming that he didn't mean to like forget that you didn't Mm. know anybody, but say, I'm, I'm sure you didn't really even realize you were doing it. I just want to bring to your attention so that, you know, next time we find a way to check in with each other 
when we're at a party. Mm. I think that's so, like that. What you just said right at the end is actually something that is so overlooked. Like the assumption that your partner has positive intent, mm. as opposed to the assumption that your partner did something to intentionally piss you off or intentionally annoy you. Whereas, like, I think Nathan and I both live from a place within our relationship where I assume positive intent. I always assume positive intent. I never assume that there's malice, that he's not in, ever trying to do anything intentionally negative or, or dark. Um, it's always my assumption to jump off into that conflict is, I know you didn't mean to do this or create this outcome. Right, right. Many people don't necessarily have that amount of generosity because they feel hurt and they can take it personally. So Mm. so some of your listeners might say something like, well, I told you last time to make sure that you didn't abandon me at the party. So you already knew Mm. that this hurt my feelings and you did it anyway. Therefore, you're inconsiderate. Mm. That's what often happens. Yeah, where there's a starts to be the beginning of a pattern. And it's deliberate, right? That yeah. I told you I didn't want to do it and you did it anyway. And what I help remind couples is that it's just unrealistic that everybody's thinking about that conversation at every mm. given moment and people are going to let you down. You know, mm. <laughs> our partners are going to let us down sometimes and forget and make mistakes. So that's a hard, a hard lesson the better your communication is with each other, the better you'll be able to provide that reassurance that Mm. Nate was able to, you know, let you know, I'm sure that he cares about you, loves you, doesn't want to let you down. And that's part of what made it possible for you to also not assign Mm. the negative intent. Mm. So it's, it's something that you symbiotically have created together. So both people can work together on that and have insight into it. Yeah. I think the turning point for me on that particular learning or lesson was from Brene Brown and her talking about um, assuming that people are doing the best they can um, and living from that being the default, not just in your romantic relationship, but people are doing the best they can. And life is better if you are living from that place. I didn't always live from that place. I didn't always have that point of view from our relationship, but that was a, a muscle that I built for sure. Yeah. And sometimes doing the best you can means that you're thinking about something in that moment that isn't your partner's best Mm. interest. And that doesn't mean that they don't love you and care about Mm. you in a profound Mm. sense of, you know, emotional attachment. So, oh, he was distracted because it was he was with his high school buddies. And that's the thing that will help you do that thing that Brene Brown is recommending. Yeah. So that without sounding critical part is really about labeling your own emotions first, isn't it? Yeah. Talking about yourself, talking about behaviors instead of personalities or characterological issues, and being specific. Mm-hmm. So notice it's not every single party that we go to, you've done this to mm-hmm. me, because then that's way too global. And that person is going to feel much less likely to feel motivated to try to meet your need because they're going to, their brain is automatically going to start thinking about did they do this? Are they really that bad? How could they, you know, and feel really, really hurt and upset when they hurt their partner? Because I agree with you, nobody wants to hurt your partner. And if you're told, not only did you do this thing, this little thing at the party, that's not a big deal. And I'm sure you didn't do it, right? If we say it like that, it's it's less likely to become critical. But if it's, you always done this, you've done this every Mm. single time. And let me list out all the times you've done it, then your partner will feel badly that they've hurt you and feel like they are not sure what they can actually do differently. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really great to talk about wants, needs, conflict styles, literacy of emotions, so much good stuff. If there was one final tweet length bit of advice or tip or recommendation, what would that be? The best way to end a fight is to really try to agree with your partner. What did they say that you agree with? And Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest issue that keeps a fight going is the tweaking, like having the last word. So let Mm -hmm. your partner have the last word and say, you know what? You're really right. And I'm going to work on this. And then go out and have fun. (laughs) Do something different. Yeah. Yeah. 
and stop that power struggle of like, do you want to be right or do you want to be in love? Do you want to be right or do you want to be in love? Exactly. And I guess that you don't need to agree fully with something either. Like you can agree in principle as, as long as you've got the understanding of where your partner's coming from and know that there's something there that needs to be changed or tweaked, then the nuances of things really don't matter. Well said, Nate. It's not about coming to an agreement. It's about making a decision. You're not ever going to agree 100% on every single thing, but can you make a decision and decide what to do moving forward that you can both live with? Then you have an actual realistic positive outcome versus giving yourself an impossible task of coming to an agreement. Yeah. 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 Laura, this has been so great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, If people have loved what they've heard today, how can they best connect with you? How can they best get your books? So my books are on Amazon, Love is an Action Verb, and one is the paperback and one is the workbook. So they're both under the same title. And I have also a whole bunch of free resources. I have a date night planner and I have a conflict management e like email course where every day I give I kind of walk you through the four main communication patterns that lead to dissatisfaction. And so mm. that's at my website, which is Laura Silverstein dot co not com but co co and it's spelled silver like the metal s-t-e-i-n laura silverstein and i have purchased and read that book and i highly recommend it (laughs) so thank you so much for joining us today laura thank you have a great day thanks heaps for joining us we love what we're doing here and want more subscribe to the date forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.